Captain Talbot Manville, class of 1972 here at the Naval Academy and the very first program manager for the Future Aircraft Carrier Program that got stood up in 1996. In 1995, the Department of Defense did a mission area study analysis that basically said we need to come up with a new aircraft carrier. And in 1996, I was put in charge of it. I am an engineering duty officer that have served on three aircraft carriers on the John F. Kennedy as the repair officer. I uh, got some experience fighting fires after the Belknap collision in November 22, 1975. I also then went on to become the main propulsion assistant, the second engineer on the USS Midway out of Japan, and then chief engineer on the USS America in, uh, during Desert Storm. In 1996, I was put in charge of the Future Aircraft Carrier Program, and here I have here five models of the 75 uh, ship designs that we looked at that kind of uh, went through and uh, looked at the, 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 uh, the models that we had. The important thing that we had to do with all these models was to compare them versus the critical capability of the aircraft carrier. And that was defined by the Joint Chiefs as independent of land bases, the aircraft carrier's air wing must simultaneously perform surveillance, battle space dominance, and strike in extended combat operations forward. So that became the criteria by which we judged all these models. We had, and here I have here, a small Stovall aircraft carrier uh, that had basically 40 air aircraft on it. 20 strike fighters and 20 other auxiliary aircraft that would uh, that would support the strike fighters. This was a small aircraft carrier that basically had 40. We then also looked at um, medium-sized aircraft carriers, and they were all also being compared with the Nimitz class. This is the Nimitz class where one of the alternative designs of the Nimitz class was to move the island out of the way from where it was between elevators two and three on the starboard side. One of the things that we found out was that where, when the airplanes rolled out, the island was in the wrong place in order to be able to execute what we wanted, what Naval Nav Air was talking about was a concept called pit stops, much like NASCAR's pit stops where the airplanes roll, roll out of the, uh, of the uh, racing area, the landing area, and then can go and taxi under their own power and then be refueled and rearmed quickly. So one of the alternatives we were looking at with the Nimitz class, if the Nimitz class was satisfactory, was to move the island. And that's why you see this island in this, in this position. We also, looked at, um, we also looked at other aircraft carriers. One, the, the, the first aircraft carrier that we kind of looked at and put aside was an aircraft carrier that the naval aviators love. Basically a dual landing deck, okay, with, uh, with uh, catapults, uh, both port and starboard on these uh, landing areas and also on the bow, and also with a ski jump forward, so we could possibly do Stovall at the same time. Uh, this aircraft carrier was, was, uh, was put aside because it was too damn big, basically. It required that all the dry docks where aircraft carriers had to be maintained or built had to be expanded, and that was uh, beyond the scope of, of, uh, of my task. So this one was put aside. <laughs> one of the other things that we, that we wanted was, what I wanted was, was a stealthy aircraft carrier, and here I'll talk about it. When I first came on board with my guys, I said, I want a stealthy aircraft carrier, and after they stopped laughing and got back in their seats, I said, what's so funny? And they said, stealthy. First of all, the hurricane bow, the very curved sides here, always provide a reflective surface area that will get back to the source. Secondly, particularly on the starboard side where you have these aircraft elevators and we don't show the details of all the angles and dangles that can reflect the radars, they are also make this unstealthy. Also, the island and also the mask has all sorts of services to reflect that, and even why bother? Because the airplanes are not stealthy. So I said, is that it? And one young man was listening to me, a, a brilliant naval architect by the name of David McWhite, and he said, okay. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get rid of the hurricane bow. I want you to get rid of the island, okay? I want you to clean up the sides, and I want you to hide the airplanes. 
And in two weeks, David McWhite came forward with this, which my uh, daughter would, would, later, would later name the aardvark because it looks <laughs> like an animal that has its snout going down the ant hole and these flappy ears on the sides. You can kind of get some idea of that. And then two weeks later, he came with this design because he had been working this. And David McWhite went on to design DD-1000 as well. And he basically got rid of the hurricane bow, came up with this wave piercing bow, which is now part of DD-1000. DD he cleaned up the sides, put this inverted skirt that's at the proper angle for stealth, okay. And he, had, he made a double decker arrangement so we could hide all the airplanes. We also had a third hangar bay that was underneath here where we could put the airplanes. And then we had launching decks off of the port and starboard and um, and we also came up with a uh, truncated pyramid island that also has the right angles for stealth that basically got rid of the mass. All these surfaces on the inside of this could be used for conformal antenna arrays, okay? And also this, and here you can see the uh, flat plate array from the Aegis weapon system that could also be put on the ship. So he basically did this. The problem with this is, if you look at this, this is an axial landing deck, and we couldn't clear aircraft out of this. And unfortunately, we, we, we weren't able to angle this deck to make this aircraft carrier stealthy. And besides, from space, you can see aircraft carriers because of their unique system, and also because all surface ships make wakes. So stealth uh, for an aircraft carrier is not, a, uh, is not a vital characteristic. However, this would make a great amphibious assault ship for Stovall. I pitched this to the Marine Corps back in uh, 1998, and they completely ignored me. <laughs> now, if I were king, one of the things that I was looking at, if we still had uh, an, a, uh, a one-step transformation ship, this was what we called study five, and if I had been king, I would have made this the aircraft carrier. The problem with this, though, is this aircraft carrier's hull was too large to be built in the uh, dry docks and would also have to require an expansion. But we also show a, a, uh, an articulated uh, ski jump up forward where you can uh, articulate and move it up and down and make this so that you could launch snowball aircraft off of this. This was a very large aircraft carrier. Now, originally, the design had it up forward, but the uh, aircraft carrier commanding officers came in and did a little IPT and critiqued this design and said, move it aft. We reduced the number of elevators from four to three. We moved the island aft. And this more or less became the prototype for the Ford class, because what this allows you to do is land the aircraft, allow them to roll off, under their own power and get to a spot where they can then main, be maintained. And what we also did, and what I'm very proud of, was the uh, team that followed me created basically a very more survivable aircraft carrier from this design by putting the weapons in ready service magazines underneath the flight deck rather than around the, the island right now where the bomb farm is now for the, for the Nimitz class. And that allowed us then to also to strategically place fueling stations along, along the starboard side here and also back aft here, where you can then quickly refuel and rearm the aircraft. And so, but this was put aside because this, this was uh, too large and it turned out to be too expensive. When, when, when we looked at this and showed, a cost of this, this turned out to be around $13.5 billion, about $7 billion for the cost of the ship, the, uh, the uh, recurring cost of the ship, uh, but another seven, seven and a half billion dollars for the 14 different technologies that we wanted to put on the ship. And interesting enough, and, and so the Navy in 1998 told us to come up with an evolutionary approach, which would start with CVN-77, a Nimitz-class carrier, okay, where we would uh, put, where we would try to put the phased array radars on it, and then uh, CVN 78, a follow-on to this with a Nimitz hull uh, that would put a new propulsion plant and the new catapult system on, 
and then 79 would have the new radars, the new catapult system, the, the, the new propulsion plant, and the uh, new arresting gear, and all the other technologies. In, 2000 and tw in 2004, the uh, Bush administration changed this to a one-step, and that has led to some problems because they pulled forward some technologies that uh, weren't mature enough, and so they've had some delays, and now the cost of the ship has gone up. But that's the initial, but so, so here is a variation of several types of aircraft carriers among the 75 that we looked at for the new aircraft carrier that is now the Ford. This is Captain Talbot Manville, signing off. Bye.